the share for this second talk of today. Um, well, it's a it's a huge privilege for me to introduce Luis Vega from the Universidad del País Vasco, um, BICAM, the Basque Center for Applied Mathematics in Bilbao, Spain. Well, um, Luis uh, got his PhD from Universidad Autónoma in Madrid, Spain. Then he, he moved to the University of Chicago for a Dixon instructor position. Then he went back to, to Spain as an assistant professor at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. And then he, he moved to, to the Universidad del País Vasco where he currently is full professor since uh, a, a good amount of, of, of years. Uh, he is also affili affiliated to the Basque Center for Applied Math, uh, where he was the director from 2013 to 2019. Among other recognitions, I would like to mention that while well, he's a fellow of the American Mathematical Society, and he got the Blaise Pascal Medal in Mathematics from the European Academy of Science in 2015. Luis has uh, written a number of fundamental works for dispersive equations and other kind of PDEs using Fourier and harmonic analysis ma mainly, with a huge impact in the community, as we can see with his more than 7,000 citations listed on, on Matsinet. See, For today, the title of his talk, well, we can see that, is The Binormal Flow and the Evolution of Viscous Vortex Filaments. Mm. So, Luis, please go ahead. Yeah, so thank you very much for the introduction. I want to be sure that you can hear me. Is that correct? Yeah, very well. Okay. So I'm th uh, and thank you very much for the invitation and, and, and to give me the opportunity of speaking about uh, this topic, which is mainly a, a joint work with uh, Marco Antonio Fontelos, but uh, hopefully if I have some time, I will make some connection with more, uh, some older, older work with uh, Valeria Vanica. And the, the summary or the, or the plan of the talk is more or less as follows. I will show movies to clarify what are the physical objects I want to, to, um, to analyze and to study. Then I will introduce the mathematical setting. I will give some uh, results. And hopefully, if I have time, I, I will make the connection with the uh, binormal flow and the so-called the localized induction approximation, which is precisely a, a, an approximation of the Biot-Savart integral that only consider local effects. And uh, so, up to here, the, the the talk will be mainly about uh, regular objects, meaning in this case curves that move in 3D, but they are close and regular. But it would be very nice if uh, we could uh, extend all these results to more uh, rough objects, like for example polygons that have corners. And the reason is that in this uh, case, for the binormal flow, you can uh, give much more complex dynamics that uh, um, involve properties that one uh, wants to have in, in turbulent fluids, like intermittency and multifractality. And because I'm not sure that we'll have time to talk about it, uh, just to say that uh, the, the complicated guy is nothing but the, the trigonometric series you see there. And with this, uh, th this guy, we can create things like uh, the one you are seeing here, where uh, you see, you can imagine that this is essentially uh, a fractal. In fact, it is more than that. It's a multifractal. And the intermittency, if you want, would be these corners that seem to appear uh, uh, randomly, if you want, although it's pretty clear that they are not completely random. For example, this is uh, related to a triangle. That's the reason why I, I, I put M equals 3 there. And for, for M equals 4, we have a similar object, but uh, not completely the same. And everything can be uh, understood in terms of the uh, Fourier series that you see on the on the on the slide. Anyway, so let's let's uh, start moving. <clears throat> and uh, uh, let's uh, first uh, the, the the most simple object is um, <clears throat> is the one you are seeing. So this is what we call a vortex filament. So uh, in principle, uh, what you can say is that the the, the vorticity is uh, is mainly concentrated in a, in a curve. And in this case, is a circle, and you see all those um, 
all those bubbles uh, uh, going around uh, this uh, this guy here. So, in a sense, um, what I would like to address is um, what are we seeing in the sense, uh, in fact, what is this guy? And secondly, how is it moving according to which law? And finally, uh, can we identify what are these uh, these uh, um, bubbles we are seeing winding around the the main object? Of course, here the the in this in this picture or in this movie, the geometry is very simple, but um, you would like to consider most uh, more complicated objects like this one, for example, where the the, the curvature is not constant and uh, and you have a more complicated uh, or, or at least distant dynamics. For example, imagine that a freeze it here is not so clear at all from this picture to, to conclude that the, at the beginning there was some kind of uh, a threefold symmetry. That's one thing. And second thing is that uh, if we start with uh, this uh, configuration, it seems that you, where you see that there is a, a clear threefold symmetry, but uh, uh, that uh, there are some axes that uh, before are in a completely uh, other situations. So this is what is called the axis switching phenomena. But in any case, the, the the questions are the same, which are these guys, can I define this as a curves and how they are moving and what is uh, all the, what are all these bubbles that we see uh, around? Uh, let me give you another example <clears throat> where you can see how this, uh, these vortex filaments can be generated. This is uh, a video that you can find in the in YouTube under the name of uh, knotted vortices, and it was uh, this experiment uh, was done in the in the University of Chicago in the physics department, <clears throat> and uh, this is what you see. In this case, it looks very much as if uh, the starting shape, this one, right doesn't change that much in the sense that it seems that it is like a, a, a silly, a, 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 a rigid motion of the curve. And it is not like in the previous one where there was some kind of uh, what I mentioned that it is called the axis switching phenomenon, right? So in the work with Frontelos, we, that uh, is the plan of this talk, we, we have a result that uh, suggests that we know who are this, who is this guy in particular, okay? So, uh, in mathematical terms, or if you want, first in 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 in, in physics, uh, in, in physical terms, what you want to describe are are, are fluids that are characterized uh, by a very precise property, which is that the vorticity is very much concentrated in a in a, in, in a small region of the of the space, in particular, in principle, even in a in a curve. These are the so-called vortex filaments and, and, and the interest of these guys uh, started with the, with the story of fluid mechanics. So it's as, it goes back to Helmholtz, Helmholtz Kelvin, <clears throat> Kirchhoff and, and others. So mathematically, uh, you describe the, the vortex filament by saying that the vorticity, which is a vector, and here I call omega, at uh, the position x and at time t equals zero, is a, a vector measure, but which is a, a delta vector measure. So it is a singular measure that such that the support is in the, in the curve chi, right? But it points in the direction of the tangent vector. So really the, the tangent vector is the one that is the, uh, the vector that describes the, the vorticity. But this, the, the, the measure is uh, homogeneous all around the, 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 the curve that I will consider is an ice curve, a close <coughs> curve with no, and a smooth, a close and smooth curve with no self-intersections. And precisely because uh, I'm, I will deal with um, uh, divergence-free uh, vector fields, then the vorticity has to uh, has also had to add this property, and this implies it's a very simple calculation that then the the gamma, which is the strength of the of the delta, has to be a constant all along the filament. So uh, you are given the vorticity, then and you assume that the the divergence uh, the, the divergence-free uh, velocity field. 
then uh, the vorticity is written as the curl of the always as the curl of the velocity but then it's not so complicated to 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 find uh, uh, the velocity from the vorticity in fact uh, one way of doing it is to compute the curl of the curl that if the divergence is zero then it is nothing but the minus laplacian and then you invert the the minus Laplacian, and this is precisely the formula you see, the integral you see on the slide, which is known and, under the name of Biot-Chabart, that uh, is similar to the one in electromagnetism, where the omega would be the, the magnetic field and, and V, the velocity, will be the electric field. Of course, this integral is extended along the support of the vorticity, so in the particular case I was mentioning in the previous slide, this would be a contour integral in the sense that it's the integral along a curve, the, the curve sigma. And uh, of course, uh, also we, we, we observe that if X in principle is a, is a, a position which is outside of the, of the support of the vorticity, because if uh, we consider X a point of the support of the vorticity, then the kernel is very singular. In particular, it's a very simple calculation to see that uh, the, the kernel, the a singular kernel goes like the inverse to the distance of x to the curve to the cube, right? So if I, uh, I'm sorry, to the square, right? Because we have x minus x prime in the numerator, in the numerator and, and the power three in the denominator. So the, the singularity is like the distance, the inverse of the distance square. So if I integrate once, I will get as a leading order the inverse of the distance <clears throat> to the curve, right? Of course, what uh, the the mathematical question would be: Can I can I really compute the velocity at the at the filament itself? And what I am saying is, in principle, <laughs> this cannot be done, right? Because it's far too singular. But if one does the calculation uh, precisely of the leading order, uh, is like the one of. Um, a straight line and then the the precisely the, the in that case so uh, although you have a singularity like the inverse of the distance i am saying however the the velocity is rotating so the overall effect of uh, of the velocity around the filament in this case will be zero because it's nothing but rotating so it is not moving the filament so you have to go to the next term and in order to do that you have to find a way of the singularizing the integral and this is typically done by adding some artificial uh, width of the filament that you call uh, epsilon. And then it is not so complicated to see that the, then the leading order is the one you see on the on the on the bottom of the slide, which is the velocities in the direction of B, which is nothing but the binormal. And the amplitude, uh, of course, is given by gamma and the, <clears throat> and the uh, one over four pi coming from the Bios Abart is growing like log of epsilon and uh, is multiplied by kappa, which is nothing but the uh, curvature. So in this, in the above expression, gamma was the circulation, which is the strength of the of the vorticity. Kappa is the, the curvature, where S is the arc length parameter, T is time, and B is nothing but the binormal vector. So at least uh, the effective uh, velocity uh, is given by, by this term. So it's uh, where the binormal appears in a in a very natural way. This calculation was done by Darrios uh, some time ago. In fact, it was done in 1906. And Darrios was at the time a student of uh, Levi Civita, who was interested in the problem for many, many years. In particular, he, he uh, suggested the existence of solutions uh, in, in 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 a paper in 1932, which uh, are the ones that uh, we think are very much related to the the third movie I, I showed before. So now uh, you want to uh, you have an initial condition and you want to uh, to solve the the corresponding equation. Here the equation is nothing but Navier-Stokes equation because I am considering uh, that you have viscosity. So in the movies, they were just real fluids. In particular, they were in, in water, right? So, so the question is, can you solve the Navier-Stokes equation uh, with an initial condition as the one that I showed before? And this was uh, an open problem for many, many years. 
um, was finally solved in a, in a celebrated paper uh, in 1989 by Giga Miyakawa. And they use a, a, a fixed point argument uh, based on Duhamel's formula. So they see everything as a, as a perturbation of the heat flow, uh, linear heat flow. So they write the solution as a, as a, a, as a Neumann series, if you want, where the first order is nothing but the heat flow of the delta of the initial condition. So in order to, to implement this uh, Picard iteration, you always need some kind of a smallness condition that in this case is nothing but the quotient between the gamma and the viscosity. So uh, what, uh, what Marco Antonio, well, in any case, a natural candidate for, <clears throat> for the evolution of the of the center of, of the corresponding uh, um, and of the center of the corresponding tube that it is generated by the by the viscosity would be really to make epsilon in the in the Rios expression uh, nothing but the, the viscosity scale, which is a square root of nu t. So then it's very natural to, to consider this geometric flow which is just to go to the Rios and say, well, uh, I'm, I'm considering a Bierstock's equation, and, and then the leading order is the heat flow, so then uh, the, the Gaussian is, uh, is uh, the corresponding uh, uh, self-similar solution is, 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 has a natural scaling, which is the square root of uh, the viscosity times the time. So this is our, uh, uh, our <clears throat> candidate for the if it, there is a meaning of what should be the, the the core of the viscous tube, this core should move in this in this way. All right. So then it is not so because you see the the the, the log of new t is nothing but a, a way of measuring time in a different way. So you just renormalize time. You just make a change of variable in time, and then you can reduce the 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 flow you see there by the, what we call the binormal flow, right? Just by changing <clears throat> time, then it is, uh, and, and you can always also uh, change uh, the, the gamma, uh, renormalize the gamma over 4 pi in the similar way. So the final conclusion is that <clears throat> the, the natural geometric flow associated to the evolution of these vortex filaments is the one you see on the, on the bottom of the slide, which is that the derivative of the curve at a given time would be nothing but the curvature times the binormal, which is uh, nothing also but the expression you see there, which is, the, which is just the, the cross product of the first derivative of the of chi, which is the, the curve, times the second derivative. So by using this expression, expression, there is no problem if the curvature is zero, because uh, we are assuming that the curve is... Uh, is, is smooth, so we can compute the first and the second derivative, and definitely we can compute the, the cross product. There are uh, a lot of uh, uh, papers, and as I said, this question goes back to the beginnings of, uh, of the uh, mathematical studies of fluid mechanics, and in particular, vortex filaments. But um, to make the story short i will just uh, focus in three of the of the references you see here i will focus in three of them one is the <clears throat> the bob gerard smets paper where they they in, in a sense they give a, a bit, the very first uh, a rigorous result of uh, up to what extent the binormal flow can be uh, the can be seen as the leading order of the evolution of the of the vortex tubes <clears throat> then, um, then there is a second paper which is uh, in the 2018 by Bedrosi and German Harab Griffiths, which is very close in a spirit to what, in a sense, what we are doing is very close to to what they are doing. And and but the the only problem because they they are the first ones that are able to to remove the smallness condition imposed by by uh, Giga Miyakawa. So this is a, a very relevant result because uh, as uh, is well known in nonlinear PDEs to be able to to 
once you are looking at critical uh, initial condition as the ones uh, I, 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 we are considering, <clears throat> which is the, the this uh, delta functions on curves, then to remove the smallness is really a big issue, and they succeed in doing it under some conditions, of course. But unfortunately, they don't give a very good. Uh, they don't give a description of how the 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 the, the solution behaves. It's very similar to, from this point of view, uh, although definitely the, it's, a, it's a relevant step forward to the Giga Miyakawa. In a sense, the, in terms of describing the solution, they don't they don't give a better description. They, they, they in terms of the dynamics, they gave, they give a better description in terms of how is the, the 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 how is the vorticity in the vortex tube that is generated because of the viscosity, right? And this is the part that uh, uh, we do in a similar way. And finally, I want to mention a recent paper by Galeas, uh, Galean Sverak that uh, appeared in the archive last year, 23, but it has been accepted in this year. And, and this is just uh, about what happens in the case of, uh, of the first video, I mean, the case of the circular vortex. Of course, again, the, the main uh, progress is that they are able to do it without the smallness assumption of Giga Miyakawa. It's a long paper and it has been uh, published in accepted in Inventiones. So that means that uh, really these questions are, are are very very complicated and and and, and there are many people and relevant people who are working uh, these days on all this. The result I will mention is is nothing but the same result as Giga Miyakawa. So we are far from these two papers I'm mentioning by Bedres Bedrosian and, and collaborators and Galea Sverak. But on the other hand, we are very general in the sense that we don't assume just a circular symmetry. <clears throat> and at the same time, we, we are able to give a much more precise uh, uh, description of the dynamics closer, we think, to the, the, the things you have seen in the videos. All right, so in order to, 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 to tell you about the results, I have to introduce uh, some notation. First, remember that chi of t is the curve that, as I said, we are going to consider is a closed curve. It is a smooth and have no self-intersections. So, so that I can always describe in uh, in this curve what uh, is called the, the, the tubular neighborhood, right? I can make a, a, a small tube around the curve such that I can put coordinates, right? And these coordinates will be given by a reference uh, or a frame, which uh, which is nothing that uh, three vectors. The, the leading one will be the tangent vector of the curve chi, and then two other vectors that I will choose depending in, on on on, on uh, the analytical uh, uh, problems I want to solve. Right? For example, I can use <clears throat> so I will have the tangent given chi. I will have the tangent vector, and then given the tangent vector. I will have the normal plane, and in the normal plane, I can use, for example, the the the, the normal and the binormal, the frenet frame. Mm -hmm. But uh, this ones, uh, this no, frenet frame, from an analytical point of view, is not uh, is not particularly nice because it assumes a lot of, uh, in particular, it, it, it assumes uh, too much regularity, and also you have the problem of the of the uh, the curvature that has to be positive. So for the analytical issues, we will mainly use the uh, what are called the parallel frame that I will not have the, the time to to explain. But it is also true that in order to describe um, uh, these asymptotics I want to mention, I will also use the what are called the, the cylindrical coordinates, right? So in the normal plane, I take the vector position that I call ER. And then I, I also generate the angular uh, um, vector, which is nothing but the cross product with the, of the tangent vector with the, the position uh, of uh, unit vector ER, right? And you see the definitions on the on the bottom of the slide. So in, in fact, you will need, we have to use like three different frames. One is the frenet frame because the binormal flow is written in the frenet frame. Other one is the another one is the the, the cylindrical coordinates where the uh, say the 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 
angular and the radial variables are in the normal plane and the tangent plane is given the vertical direction, if you want. And analytically, I will use uh, the so-called um, parallel free. Anyway, so this is the, the, the main result and I will need some time to explain what, uh, what the result says. So first of all, the regularity, it has to be C3 because really I have to compute two derivatives of the tangent vector. In fact, I, I have to be able to speak about the curvature and torsion. <clears throat> and torsion implies, curvature implies uh, the derivative of the tangent vector, but the torsion implies two derivatives of the tangent vector. Then, I, um, as I said, I am under the Giga Miyakawa assumption. That means that the, the gamma over the viscosity has to be small. And I, 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 I know that uh, I will need also that my curves move that they are going to move according to the binormal flow. So I need that somebody gives me that uh, uh, if uh, chi of S0 is the initial condition, then I am able to construct the solution of the binormal flow for up to capital time t. And in fact, that I have a uniform tubular neighborhood for all time. And this means that um, the, the what you see on the slide, that I have, uh, uh, there exists a capital R such that uh, the <clears throat> I can put coordinates in the in the set that is generated by which is a distance of the curve uh, at time t which is smaller than r over two, and uh, this are uh, is a very simple calculation. It's just to consider the the distance function to the square and to minimize, and you see that uh, then the r has to be of the order of the inverse of the curvature because I am assuming that the the curvature is regular, then this is uniformly bounded. Okay, so once I have uh, this tubular neighborhood, then I can create the, the frame. And the frame, of course, is a given by the tangent vector and the, the coordinates given in the normal plane. And <clears throat> the tangent vector is capital T of ST. So then the vorticity is... Uh, is uh, uh, I describe the vorticity in uh, in um, an, an asymptotic expansion for t is small, so that means that the viscosity times the time is, is, is small, and I am describing it in terms of powers inverse powers of the viscosity times the time, right? Which is what uh, you see on the slide. So the first order is uh, is what uh, is very much like the straight uh, filament, the one that uh, at time zero is given by a straight line because it is just in the direction of t. And what we see is nothing but the, the Gaussian diffusion on the of the vorticity, right? Because you will have uh, uh, e, the, the Gaussian e to the minus rho square over four, which is nothing but the heat flow in 2D. And in the reason of the power one over new t precisely come because I am I am diffusing the, the, the viscosity in the normal plane, which is 2D. Right, rho here, remember, was the, the 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 distance little r over a square root of nu t, which is what I call the the, the viscosity scale. So this is the uh, the leading order I mentioned at the very beginning, right? That uh, it, it comes from the from the Biot-Savart law. So the really new thing is the the uh, there are two things, but in the, one of of them is the next term where we see that uh, we have. A, a, a power law now, which is like just the inverse of the square root of new t. So it's uh, we have a, we have improved with respect to the first term, a, a, a one half power of uh, the viscosity times the time. And what we see is that in here in this second term, I see I still see the Gaussian. I is all uh, again is pointing in the tangent direction, but now I see the curvature. And I see the curvature times the cosine of theta, where the cosine of theta is, is nothing but the normal uh, direction, which is, uh, as I explained in the previous slide. So this is the, the new thing, but also uh, it's important to, to, re to, to realize that uh, I am saying that the capital T is moving according to the binormal flow, right? So it's like I'm describing the vorticity as a tube, which is of the size of capital R, and this inside of this tube, I say what is uh, what are the leading orders, right? And the leading orders are one. The first one is one over nu t, and the second one is one over square root of nu t. Then you have a third term that is still <clears throat> uh, of the size one over square root of nu t, that. Uh, 
that in fact I need it in order to in order to compute the second term. I, uh, we need it to construct this third term, right? The difference here is that uh, now you see it on the on the slide that uh, the amplitude is now is, is small with respect to the previous one. Why? Because we are in the Giga Ginyakawa uh, condition, so gamma is small. And then you see that uh, this, in, the, in the first term, I mean the second term, the one of the curvature, it goes like gamma, while this third term goes like gamma squared. And then you have a reminder term, omega tilde, <clears throat> that satisfies uh, an, an energy uh, inequality and goes like uh, uh, essentially like uh, uh, the viscosity times the time, although there is a logarithmic correction. And except for this logarithmic correction is the next term. So it is, uh, you have, uh, of course, this is an L2 norm and the, and the other terms is an L infinity norm. But if you really do the, the math, you see that this uh, error term is gaining one uh, square root of new t power in terms of the previous one, except of, as I said, this logarithmic term. So this is what we are doing. We are really describing in a very precise way how the vorticity is behaving. So we we decide, we say that there is a core of this tube. The core is moving according to the binormal flow and the, descript, the description, I'm sorry, the description of the vorticity in this in this tube is uh, is very precise. All right, so this is about the vorticity, but I really would like to say what is the the velocity, right? And in order to 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 compute the velocity, because I know the vorticity, I have to compute the Biot-Savart integral. So then I have to find a way of de-singularizing the Biot-Savart integral. So in order to do that, I need a, an extra uh, bit of information, which is what you see on the slide. So remember that the, the leading order was given by uh, a Gaussian, which is uh, what now I call omega zero of rho. Rho, is, it is written on the slide, is nothing but the distance to, to the core uh, over the viscosity uh, scale, which is a square root of nu t. And the relevant fact is first that omega was... Um, the Gaussian, but the relevant fact uh, is that what is the velocity for this particular guy? And it's a very simple calculation, but uh, very interesting that the velocity associated to this leading order, what is called the Lamoussin, <coughs> is the one you see on the bottom of the slide, which is gamma over 2 pi, 1 over rho, times 1 minus e to the minus rho squared over 4. So in particular, this uh, capital V sub zero of rho is zero at time, at, at uh, rho equals zero. This is the, the typical uh, the situation we, we see in the movies that if you have a tornado, your life is very simple in the, in the eye of the tornado because really the velocity is zero. Your problems start to be much bigger when you start to move say which uh, rho of the order of one, which is like uh, when the distance is like the uh, uh, viscous scale, which is the square root of nu t, because then really it grows um, like the inverse of the distance. And, and, and this is the one over r, and there definitely the angular velocity is very, is very, is, <clears throat> is very big. But at the eye of the, of the, of the tornado, say at the, at the really, um, core of the, at the center of the core, the velocity uh, is zero for the leading order. So then you have to look at the next term, right? And the next term came uh, with the curvature times uh, 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 another power, right? Uh, uh, <clears throat> which was one, uh, you gain a, a square root of nu t. So this is what it is written in this lemma, that the leading order is the one that I have just said, which is this V0 of rho, that as, as, I, as I'm pointing out, because this is very relevant, is zero at zero. So that means that then close to the to the uh, the core, the, the leading order is precise the, the one of the binormal that you see on the slide, which is the curvature times the logarithmic of the scale square root of nu t. Right? So... It is not that we give a very precise description of the vorticity, we also give a very precise description of the velocity. Of course, one has to be careful. Don't pay too much attention to the other ones because there are, there is an old one of uh, correction 
in the in the binormal flow that is given by this capital F, capital H, that we can give very precise information about this. Uh, functions, but uh, uh, don't pay too much attention. I have to write the theorem, and this is what it is. But just focus on the binormal flow just in the logarithmic term. And, <clears throat> and then you, we have the, um, the uh, O of one corrections, where you have this capital V, again, that is a very precise description, but <clears throat> But which is not really, uh, it's a very local term. It's a local term because it is kappa of st. The, the really difficulty comes with this V star, which is a non-local term, and which is uh, is, uh, is the, what we call the desingularization of the Biot-Savart integral, right? Which is what is really the velocity at the origin at rho equals zero is precisely the one you are seeing. You, you see... The, in the direction of the binormal, a growth which is like the logarithmic, the log of a new viscosity times the time to the minus one half, an O of one, which is very precise because you see log of two plus one over two, gamma here is the Euler constant. But then you have an O of one, which is uh, is, is pointing in any direction. And it is this uh, B star of zero is the one you see uh, and the integral you see on the bottom of the slide, which is the, Precisely the, the singularization of uh, the bios Savart integral. <clears throat> okay, so this is what I was uh, say, saying at the beginning that I would give a very precise description of, of what we see. So anyway, I don't have too much time to to explain about the binormal flow. It's just to say that, of course, uh, you start with a straight line, it's a straight line, you start with a circle, it's a circle, and you start with analysis, it's analysis. But uh, there, is an, uh, there is an amazing fact that if you use what is called the Hashimoto transformation, you end up with a very well-known guy, which is um, the cubic uh, NLS, right? And for this cubic NLS, uh, you have plenty of solutions, like, for example, the ones uh, uh, found by levi civita in 32, you have theorems that they have, uh, some of them which uh, have taken plenty of time, like, for example, the one by Tsutsumi and Burgen. And <clears throat> you even have very precise, uh, very, a very precise description of uh, traveling waves, like the th third video we saw. In particular, there is a very well-known paper of Kida that uh, I, recently, I recently extended with Claudia Garcia that, uh, in a sense, is telling you that is this paper where uh, uh, I am thinking when I say that for the third video, I know, I think I know what is the, the curve we are seeing. And it's one of these curves found by Kida. And is the, I don't have the time, really. I, I It is uh, just almost time. And I, I really wanted to show you uh, another couple of videos that I think are relevant. These are the, the Kida solutions that, as you see, for example, in three, you see that essentially, except the rotation, there is a traveling wave of the, of the, of the, is a traveling wave solution. Anyway, so <clears throat> I really would like to go further. And why? Because the, so far, the, the, the dynamics is simple in a sense. It took some time to understood, but I don't see any complication of the dynamics. And this is because the, the curve is, is too regular. However, in this case, uh, um, in these pictures we saw, we uh, and then look at the title, which is what is called the coherent structure. It's a very old paper. And this is what uh, these coherent structures is some struct is what uh, one expects to find in 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 turbulence. Turbulence is not comp is not true that turbulence is just a random effect. There are some internal order, and, and in order to describe this internal order, people think that these coherent structures <clears throat> are useful. In particular, uh, these, uh, these singular uh, structures also appear, for example, in, the, in, uh, in this movie, which is uh, really from my point of view, it's really amazing. So you have seen the typical parallel uh, vortices that they start to interact. You see, they create these, all these waves and eventually they they create this reconnection. And after this reconnection, you it seems that you obtain something which is very reminiscent of the previous slide, right? So <clears throat> what can we say about uh, this thing? Well, 
uh, in the case of the binormal flow, the self-similar solutions are these ones, so which are pretty reminiscent of the of the the, the, pic, the pictures and the video we have seen before. But in this case, as you see uh, at the very bottom, you see that you have a corner. So really, we cannot. It is not just the. It is not only the problem that it is not closed. This is not really the issue. The issue is that uh, uh, that the curvature is infinite at one point at time c, right? And then we don't know how to handle with this, and we expect to do it in the future. However, if uh, um, uh, this is uh, just a, a slide saying that uh, these objects uh, uh, are related to something which are called chirps and oscillatory sing singular uh, singularities that were st were studied by Meyer and Jafar um, uh, some time ago, and there are some also results uh, uh, experimentally that says that these chirps are needed for for this if you want to describe intermittency in, in fluids just using vortex filaments to finish i want to show you these two pictures one is the, this is for the binormal flow this video so the on the top you see a, a polygon with 15 sides and in the bottom you see a, a circle and on the right you will see the trajectory of one of the point and as you will see it's um, is very different in the case of the polygon to the case of the straight line. So the, <clears throat> this is the fractal or multifractal I was showing at the beginning. And if you go to the case of the triangle, uh, it is even more dramatic. The interesting here, here, thing here is that at very small times, you see these horseshoe structures and the cell similar solution I was men mentioning, but if you keep moving, there is a moment where the axes are switched very much as we saw in the in the second movie, right? And uh, <clears throat> uh, just to finish, to say that really uh, all these two uh, movies, the last two movies, can be described just by by calling to this uh, well-known object in, in, in Fourier series and well-known also if you want to solve the the free Schrodinger equation with uh, periodic boundary conditions. And I think that uh, this is all. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luis, for, for your talk. Uh, well, now we can ask some, some questions. If you have some questions for Luis, please uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, it's open for audio or so video. Uh, if not, I can start with uh, a couple of them. So, Luis, for the for the functional spaces that are involved, well, at some point you just mentioned C three functions, but uh, in which functional space you 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 get your results? Okay, so <clears throat> for the 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 fluid part, I mean the navier stokes equation, you really uh, that's what you need C three say. Uh, the, uh, one of the things we are lacking is that uh, we don't have i mean we have to to rewrite the paper in a sense we have to keep track better of the dependence on the curvature and the torsion because these are uh, very relevant guys huh? the mm, these traveling wave solutions i was mentioning later on for the binormal flow are very much related to the torsion and, and of course, in C3, uh, all the bounds we have is that we can assume just curvatures which are finite and torsion which are finite. But uh, really, these two these are two new parameters, if you want, that if you go to Giga Miyakawa, you don't see, right? Because uh, the norm that Giga Miyakawa uses is a very weak norm. It's just Morey Campanato, right? So this is the difference, if you want. You are asking me which is the functional setting. In Giga Miyakawa, it's just the Morey Campanato norm, which is very weak, and you don't see the you don't see the geometry. On the other hand, we impose a very a big regularity, but we see the geometry. Okay. Sure. And then in going to the, the, the cubic NLS, then the well, this is a completely different issue and and for uh, uh, rough objects as the ones I, <clears throat> I was mentioning for the equilateral triangle, this is a long story and, uh, and and it has taken us, this is the main work I have done with Valeria Vanica and, and the functional setting description is, is, is delicate. I mean, 
it's, it's another talk. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, please, if you have if you have if you have more questions, please uh, feel free, feel free to just to open your mic and and ask. Um, well, I have another question. If uh, in the meantime, <laughs> no, for the behavior in time, you know, the first result has a a, a short time capital T, so that's because you are uh, you are remaining near the original configuration, right? Well, in fact, this is what matters, really. This is because you really want to make a description of uh, how the the viscosity regularizes the singularity, so. Really, what you want to describe what happens at very short times, because if these are the times where you see the singularity. If you want, it's like an inverse problem, like in the previous talk, that I want to, for a, a later time, I want to identify in a later time where the viscosity typically kills everything, I want to identify in the later time which was my singularity at time C. So really, this is, uh, in a sense, uh, it is not a problem that the time is small. You see, even for the the example of in the binormal flow, if I I want to describe all that uh, complex behavior, I only need a small time because I have uh, multifractality and cell similarity. So, for a very small time, I am able to see all these uh, uh, complex dynamics. So. Really, it is uh, so. Time is of the of the size of one in the sense that gamma over nu is one tenth. Then the time will be one hundred. But in fact, this is the small parameter you are using to make your description. So, it is not a problem. It is what it has to be. Of course, it is not true that, uh, for example, in terms of the videos, what we are describing is true that for the videos we are describing, in principle, what happens just for one tenth of the period. So, for example, in the case of the threefold symmetry that it seems very much periodic, right? Then our theorem only gives what is happening in the in the one tenth of the period or something like that, right? And it would be very nice for that example to be able to extend our result to say all the quasi period or whatever. And this is a very nice question, which is related to the fact that it was mentioned before. We don't have a good quantitative dependence in the curvature and the torsion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Luis. Uh, I'm looking at the chat. There is no question. So uh, last chance to ask a, a question to, to Luis. Um, if not, well, uh, Luis, I really thank you for, for your talk and for all your work all these years. So yeah. thank <clears> you <throat> for your support to the community, support to the community. Yeah, of course. I mean, if anybody is interested, I will be more than happy to to answer the, whatever the questions. And yeah, that's it. Thank you again for the invitation. It was oh, really nice. Hopefully we will see each other at some point. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. yeah.